Proverbs chapter number 14. As it has been the last few weeks, we're going to have uh, a two-part message. Uh, part one this morning, part two this afternoon. And um, we're going to look at a uh, topic. Um, I have never preached, ever, I have never preached a message on this topic. Um, you know, it gets hit during messages, you know, uh, mentioned, uh, but I've never preached a whole entire message on it. And, and my prayer all week, this week and last week in preparing for this is that it will help. Of course, I want it to help our church, but I want it to help indiv- people on an individual basis. And so please... Ask God to speak to your heart this morning. In Proverbs chapter 14, look in verse number 14. The Bible says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Let me ask you a question this morning. I don't want an answer out loud, but I want you to think about this. How does a person go from being a solid, faithful, and when I say faithful, people's minds automatically go to faithful to church. I'm just talking about faithful in general, okay? How does a person go from being a solid, faithful Christian to being backslidden? How did the prodigal become a prodigal? Luke 15, you know, uh, the prodigal son. Um, How is it that somebody can be as faithful as they can be and then it takes an act of Congress to find them? How does that happen? Can I just tell you, I'm I'm just being honest with you this morning, the pastor worries every time somebody doesn't show up to church. Every time. I don't care if it's, I don't care the I don't care the age, the person, it does not matter. I, I the pastor worries every single time somebody does not show up for church. You say, why do you worry if I don't show up for church? I've been in this thing too long. I know how the devil works. And it scares the fire out of me. And I'm going to explain it. And, well, I'm not going to explain it later. I'll explain it now. When I do that, I'm not taking it personal that somebody that doesn't show up for church, is, they're not, I don't look at it like that's something they're doing to me. I don't take it personally. I know some preachers that do. You know, like, well, they didn't show up, and they look at it as an attack on them. No, I don't. Too many times in our fundamentalist circles, everything revolves around the preacher, and and it's not that. Uh, uh, The Bible preacher looks at people who are backslidden, and they ask themselves this, why are they treating God that way? Not why are you treating me that way. You're not treating me anyway. Why, why do people treat God that way? And, uh, and, and listen, every person that has ever gotten backslidden, I promise you they never ever pictured them give themselves getting backslidden. They never dreamed that they would be. And, uh, and people will, not only did they never dream it would be them, they will go so far as to say that'll never happen to me. Do you know how many people I could tell you of right now that are not in church who have said, I will always be in church? Why is that? I'm not going to take the time to turn there. We've we got a lot today to cover. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Greater people than us have gotten backslidden. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you know, I'll go so far as to say this. Do you know how many people I have said that, or that I've heard say that'll never happen to me and it happened quicker than if they would have never said it? Yeah. 
may we be reminded of the words of Peter who said, though all the world forsake thee, I'm never going to forsake thee. And a few days later, he was warm in his hands by the world's fire, denying that he ever knew God and cussing. I, I see it all over the country. You, you go to a place and, and you're, used, you're just used to seeing people. I, I went to a church just this year. Uh, a dear friend of mine, a pastor, had a good couple show up in that church. Good, solid couple. He would be the kind of guy that every pastor wants in his church. Behind him, faithful, loyal, defender, protector, solid guy. I mean, wife just jumped in, helped out in the church, pre helped the preacher's wife. I mean, whenever something was going on outside of normal services, this guy was always hanging out uh, with the preacher, and they were always working around doing stuff. And, uh, and uh, been there a couple of years, and, and I go back here just uh, several weeks ago, and... Um, I get there for the Monday night service and this couple's not there. It was the kind of people that I go, something is not right here. I didn't ask the preacher about it. I said, well, you know, it's the first night, work, whatever, maybe work schedule, something, I don't know. Tuesday night they weren't there. I asked the preacher Wednesday morning when we met for breakfast. I said, preacher, what's up with brother so-and-so? And here's what the preacher said. He just, he just hung his head. What happened? They got sideways, listened to the wrong people in the church, and just quit. Just quit. And I'm telling you right now, we, we can say this till we're blue in the face, but people don't get it. This couple would be the very couple that say we will never leave. We'll never leave. No matter what anybody else does, we will never. Well, guess what? It, that, that didn't happen. And we have seen it in this church. Here, people faithful and, and involved and just no longer here. And, 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 and again, it, it's not about the preacher. It's not about the church. It's not that folks are not faithful to New Life Baptist Church. They aren't faithful to God. Okay, that's the problem. Why? Backslidden. So let's define it first. What, what does backslidden mean? Remember I told you about the Oxford English Dictionary? Are you ready for the deepest definition you've ever heard? Backsliding. To slide back. <laughs> told you it was deep. That was worth the trip, right, to church this morning. It means to fall away from faith and practice. Go over to 1 Kings chapter 11. We see Solomon. 1 Kings chapter number 11. Every pastor in the country hears this from people. You ain't never going to have to worry about me, preacher. I appreciate the sentiment. But I, and that's, yes, that's usually when a preacher starts worrying. First Corinthians chapter, first Corinthians, first Kings, first Kings chapter 11, verse number nine. God got mad at somebody. Why did he get mad at him? Well, let's look at what it says. First Kings chapter 11, verse nine. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Hey, can I tell you, hey, listen, if you're saved here this morning, God has appeared to you. Amen. Don't turn your back on the God that has appeared to you. 
and verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. What happened with Solomon? He got involved with women who turned his heart away from God. Who are we talking about? The wisest man that that ever lived. Okay, so Solomon was King David's son and he went after many strange women and his heart got turned to their gods and we're going to stand here and say, I ain't never going to do anything like that. Of course it's in our heart at the time not to do that. There ain't a single person in this room that guarantees that you will be here one year from today. I, again, it's not your heart to leave. It's not your heart to go. But guess what? There are people that are not here today who it was their heart never to go. You say, well, explain that, Brother Craig. I'll give you the explanation. The devil is very smart. The devil is very slick. Go over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. The Lord Jesus told the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, verses 2 and 3, he talked about all the good things about the church at Ephesus, but he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. What happened to the church at Ephesus? They got backslidden. They got backslidden. In a general sense, backsliding is a growing cold toward God and the things of God. It's losing an interest in the things of God. Listen, you want to know what's scary? A person can be on the front row Sunday and Thursday and still be backslidden. There might be people in this very room here right now. You're here, but you're backslidden. You say, how? I'm here. What was our text? The backslider in heart. The backslider in heart. Now, when I say, I just want to clarify this. When I say the things of God, you could be like a growing cold toward the things of God or a falling away from uh, the things of God. Here's what I mean by that. The word of God, prayer. Do you you know what I struggled with for a lot? I I don't know, a lot, maybe a lot, I don't know. At times, there's times in my life I never... Reading the Bible was never a problem, but prayer was a problem. Falling away from God and the things of God, the word of God, prayer, church attendance, serving God, witnessing, holiness, separation, tithing, giving to missions. All right, so so, uh, uh, point number one was defining backsliding. Number two Backsliding is a gradual process. Backsliding is a gradual process. Nobody that falls away or gets backslidden makes a split-second decision to just walk away. Or I should say, hardly ever does it work that way. It's like all of a sudden, um, I'm going to use probably the most faithful guy I know in this church as Bill. All right? I'm not saying you guys aren't faithful. I'm saying Bill does stuff around here that nobody knows anything about. I live here. I see his truck here, okay? I, if Bill Ewell does not walk through church doors on a Sunday or Thursday, something's wrong, okay? Nobody like Bill all of a sudden just, where's Bill? He's not, we ain't seen Bill in a month. Haven't heard from him, haven't talked to him. Hardly ever does that happen. 
It's a gradual process. It's a gradual process. It takes time. Why? Because what does the devil do? He wears down the saints. He doesn't just take them out. He wears them down. Then he takes them out. Now, I'm going to give you an example of backsliding being a gradual process. The example that I'm going to use about backsliding being a gradual process is let's take quitting church, for example. Rare are the people that just all of a sudden, after a longevity of faithfulness, just leave and never come back ever. No warning signs, nothing. That don't happen. Here's what happens. First... There's a mental struggle of being in their heart and their mind about being in church all the time. They think all kinds of things. Why do I have to be there all the time? Of course, we all know that it's only the preacher who has to be there all the time. Right? He's the only one required to be in church all the time. And then the devil will plant little seeds in, in their mind like, you know, I, I, man, I could do so much more. I could get a lot more done around the house. I, could, I, I got all, oh, man, my list and all this kind. And, 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 and they start thinking, man, I, you know, I could, probably, I could probably skip a service every now and then. I know, I know. I can always go back and watch it on YouTube later. Can I just give you a warning? I'm making a promise to New Life Baptist Church today. YouTube ain't going to be around forever. You say, are they shutting down YouTube? No, they're not shutting down YouTube. I'm praying about shutting it down. I'm praying about it. There's a, there's a few reasons why I haven't done so already. I, there's so, just so many people that love my preaching that, that I would hate to do them a disservice. Uh, insert sarcasm. You know, that's the kind of things they make clips of and spread them around. Now, keep in mind, the whole time people are thinking that that when they're thinking these things about maybe missing a service now and again, keep in mind, during this time, they're 100% faithful. They're not missing anything. They're here. Step number two, they finally, after working up some courage with themselves, they decide that it's okay to start missing some church. Some. Not all the time. Once in a, so, so what they'll do is they'll start with the most unimportant service of the week, Thursday. Thursday's not important. I mean, why, you know, Thursday's the middle of the week, and people work all day. And, and you know, Thursday, midweek services are man-made services. God did not ordain Thursday service. God didn't ordain Sunday evening services or afternoon services either. He didn't ordain Sunday morning services. He ordained the first day of the week. At some point we meet. Okay, obviously. But can I send a clear message to everybody in New Life Baptist Church? Thursday night is no less important than Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning. The men that preach in this pulpit other than me on a Thursday night and including me spend just as much time preparing a message for a Thursday that we do a Sunday or a Sunday afternoon. Preacher, preacher only preaches 30 minutes on a Thursday. The only, the, 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 we deliver you a 30-minute lesson. Do you know how long it takes to get a 30-minute lesson? Hours. Hours. And here's the thing about starting to miss occasionally. You want to know what it is about missing occasionally? Humanly speaking, it's always a legitimate reason. It's a legitimate reason. You say, what's that? Well, it starts out maybe, maybe sick or maybe work. 
But you know what happens? Them excuses are too handy to use. And they get overused. Not missing every Thursday, just one here and there. And then you know what eventually happens? It always happens. Then all of a sudden, it's no more Thursdays at all. Except once every few weeks, just to throw people off their trail. Man, we, we, we ain't seen, I'll use Bill again. We ain't seen Bill in a few weeks. No, he was just here last Thursday. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was, he was. He had to put a little token service in there to let people not remember that it was five Thursdays since we've seen him. I'm telling you. So then the third step is Thursday nights eventually become a thing of the past. And, um, and so, you know, we throw in that occasional one. And then, and then what happens? Next, Thursday nights are just out, and now other services start like Thursday started. Sunday afternoons, eh. Sunday mornings, eh. Yeah. Pastor's Bible class. Can I just remind Pastor's Bible class members that when you signed up for it, you committed to pass it through to the end, and we've got 30% of that class that hasn't been there in three or four months. Where you been? Just throwing that out there. Oh, I just I got so much to do. Talk to me about so much to do. You're getting zero. You're, you're getting, I'm not even going to give you this. <laughs> Talk about so much to do. Yeah, so much to do. My foot, so much to do. Ministries go. Man, how come, how come the garbage didn't get emptied this week? Other stuff starts to go. You say, Brother Craig, here you are, third week in a row, fourth week in a row, being mean. I'm not being mean. I'm mad at the devil, and I hate how he treats God's people, and I hate how God's people are letting him have their way with him. That's what I hate. That's what I hate. And then fifth step is this. It just all comes to a head. Today is the final day that the, the walk out the door is the final walk out the door. There, there has to be that. It has to come eventually. And then finally there's that. This is the last. This is the last day. Well, Brother Craig, I'm not quitting the church. I just don't want to do this. All you're telling is what's in your heart. The backslider in heart. And everybody that takes that fifth step and walks out the door for the last time, not a single one of them intended it when they first started missing to go that way. None of them did. But it always goes that way. Preacher, you're exaggerating. Okay, I'm not dumb, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm also not the smartest person in the world. But do you think I've seen a few things in 41 years of being around the church? I've seen, I know how it goes. I know how it ends. And everybody's a special case. Everybody, they're never going to be the ones like all the rest of them. It's just they got special circumstances. I'm just telling you, take it. Listen, I, I'm nobody. But could you please just... Give me a little bit of knowledge, authoritative knowledge and experience of what I've seen in 41 years of being around churches. So let's look at the backsliding of Lot. Go to Genesis chapter 13. There's lots of examples in the Bible of backsliders. Lot is probably the best example of how far you can go. This is how important this message is. This is how important this message is. I want to preach the whole thing before lunch. 
If we did, lunch wouldn't be until 2 o'clock. I'm telling them. Stacy knows what's coming. I set a record in notes today. I've never in my life had 24 pages of notes. But this is how intense this is. This is how crazy this is. This is how uh, serious this is. You say, why? Because I look out over our congregation and I see people that are at the backslidden in heart stage. And it's only a matter of time before they become backslidden in body. I see it and it terrifies me. I was walking around this sanctuary yesterday praying. Prayed for every single person in this room yesterday. Walking around here. And I got, this is weird. Weird in the aspect of, weird in the aspect of, God has never told me this before about somebody in this church. I came across a name. And God told me to pray extra hard because Satan is fixing to go after him. What did Jesus tell Peter? He said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. And God brought that verse to my mind and said, you better pray for him because Satan has got him in his target. He's got his sights on him. You say, who was it? I ain't telling you who it was. I might tell the person who it is. But can I just tell you this? I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. But God just told me about that for one person. He didn't mean it. It doesn't mean it's not true for the rest of you. Genesis chapter 13, look at verse number five. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right hand. If thou, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Uh, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest into Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Notice that that verse about the wicked men of Sodom is in the 13th book and the 13th verse of the, or the, or the 13th chapter of the first book in the 13th verse. And the number 13 is the number of rebellion. So let's notice the gradual downward progression of Lot. Number one, covetousness. Chapter 13, look at verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. You know what happens? In the step of backsliding, we get our eyes off of God and on things that we shouldn't have. 
It's the only explanation for a person to quit reading their Bible. They got their eyes off of God. It's the only explanation for a person that doesn't pray. They got their eyes off of God. It's the only explanation uh, for, uh, 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 for why people don't come to church. They get their eyes off of God. The truth of the matter is, it's not a, it's not a eye problem. It's a heart problem. But you know this? I, this is something I never thought about before when it comes to covetousness. The object of our covetousness is not always something visible with the eyes. You say, well, what are you talking about? We could get covetous with our ideas. You say, what do you mean we get covetous with our ideas? We look at somebody that has a, a particular attitude that we want to have that kind of attitude. Somebody that has a certain mindset. We want to think that of a certain mindset. Or we look at a perceived lifestyle that they live, and we want that kind of lifestyle, or, or a perceived freedom that they have. Whatever the object of the covetousness is, it has its roots in selfishness. Selfishness. Step number two in the gradual process of backsliding. Covetousness, then we choose too low. Look at verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves. He could have went up on the mountain. But he, he, he chose the plain instead of the mountain. Can I describe human Kind in 2023, people set very low standards for themselves. Very low standards. It's the easy way. Perceived easy way. Perceived easy way. The old hymn says, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? Laodicea has changed that hymn to, I wonder, have I done the least for Jesus. Not the best, but the least. Listen, can I tell you, child of God, when it comes to the Christian life, set high standards for yourself. Set high standards for yourself. Go over to chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Look at verse number 17. The two angels have come. They've warned Lot. It's time to get out. Verse 17, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad. Talking about Lot and his family. The, the angels brought him and his family. That he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed. People today would rather live in risk in the valley than in the safety of the mountain. Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Step number three in the gradual process of backsliding. Compromise. Go back to chapter 13. Preached a whole message on it three, four weeks ago, however long ago, about compromise. Genesis chapter 13, look at verse number 12. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. He didn't go set up camp in Sodom. I'm not living in Egypt. Lot wasn't living in Sodom. He was living in the shadow of Sodom. Just like the shadow of Egypt. He's living in the shadow of, of Sodom. Could Lot technically say, I am not in Sodom? Yes, technically. That he... he 
God does not want us living close to the edge. He doesn't want us to go just a little way. He told them to go three days journey into the wilderness. Get away from Egypt. That's why Pharaoh's compromise uh, offer of, yeah, you can do everything you got to do, just do it here. No, it's not acceptable. What does the Bible say about this, about living near Sodom? I'm going to give you these verses. We're not going to take the time to turn, but, but you can write the reference down. Let me read them to you. Proverbs 6, 5. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the flower, uh, fowler. Fly away. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 2 Timothy 2, 22, Flee also youthful lusts. We have to be reminded constantly all the times that Paul was preaching against fornication, he wasn't telling the world. He was telling the church. Get away from it. Fly away. Flee. Get away from fornication. Flee idolatry. Flee youthful lusts. You say, Brother Craig, you know, don't, don't, don't you trust young people today? No. No. You say, why? I don't trust adults. I trust our flesh to be flesh. I don't trust myself. Why do you think I would trust somebody else? <laughs> Step number four in the gradual process of backsliding, he's lots captured by the enemy. Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, look at verse number 10. The, the battle, the, the kings are coming. They're going to they're gonna, uh, overtake. And verse 10, and the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. Verse 11, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And look at verse number 12, and they took Lot, Abram's son. Wait, what does that say? Who dwelt in Sodom? You know what happened between Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 14? He moved. He moved and dwelt in Sodom. Do you know that if he wouldn't have got into Sodom, he wouldn't have been taken captive? Man, it just seemed like the devil got me. Yeah, because you made yourself catchable. You made yourself, you were where you were not supposed to be. How is it that he moved in? You can't live that close to sin and not get captured. Living in sin will obviously affect you, but can I tell you, I, can I give you this warning? Living near sin will affect you. Proverbs 6, 27, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? How many times have you heard somebody say this? How many times have you said this? I can handle it. Every drunk thought that. Every dopehead thought that. Every pothead thought that. Every whoremonger thought that. They all thought, I can handle it. Yeah. How'd that work out for you a lot? How, how did just pitching your tent towards Sodom work out? Step number five in the gradual process of backsliding, carnal living. Carnal living. Uh, go to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 
Genesis chapter 19, look at verse number 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. First, Lot is pitching his tent toward Sodom. Then he's dwelling there. Now he's on the town council. You say, he didn't say he was on the town council. That's where the city fathers sat. In that culture, that Middle Eastern culture, the, the, the city fathers sat at the gate of the city. That's where they met. And now Lot is with them. You know what has happened? He has gained worldly influence, but he has lost his spiritual influence. He's gained his worldly influence, but he's lost his spiritual influence. Proof? Modern day illustration of that? Hey, man, talking to your coworkers, why don't you come to church with me uh, Sunday? And they're thinking to themselves, come to church with me Sunday. I was just partying with them Friday night at a bar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he's asking me to go to church? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Lot lived in and now he loves the place that God hated and is fixing to destroy. The majority of Christians today are not spiritual. The majority of Christians today are carnal. I remember an old preacher back in the 80s. I'm talking the 80s. Who, who here was born after 1990? Raise your hand if you were born after 1990. Okay, I... This preacher told me this before you guys were even alive. He said the thing that grieved him the most as he traveled around the country was the carnality in the churches. In the 80s. 40 years deeper into Laodicea, it's better? No. No. So, okay, ready? You ready for this one? You ready? This ain't the last step. I don't think. Okay, there's, okay. So we're talking about the, the gradual downward progression of backsliding, covetousness, number one. Number two, making lo, the, the low choices. Number three, compromise. Number four, being captured by the enemy. Number five, carnal living. Number six, unthinkable weakness. This is where... This is where the strongest effects of backsliding are starting to be, starting to kick in. Starting to be practiced. So God declares he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He sends two angels to rescue Lot and his family uh, before God destroys the place. And so go to Genesis chapter 19. Let's look at verses uh, 4 and 5. Now, we remember that we're in where? What's the name of the two cities we're in? Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know why they never call them Gomorrahites, but they call them Sodomites. But so we do understand what that is. They were Sodomites. To use a politically correct term today, they were homosexuals. Okay, whatever, whatever term you want to call them, I, I prefer the Bible term because the world hates that. You know, don't do this, but you know, you go up to some fruit loop on the road and call them a sodomite. They, don't, they do not like to be called that. They don't mind you calling them a queer. They call themselves that. They don't mind calling them any kind of names. But I said, no, you, no, God says you're a sodomite. They hate that. 
But that's what's going on here. So, um, look in verse 4, uh, uh, Psalm, Psalm, Genesis 19, verse 4. So the angel shows up. They're there sent by God to get Lot and his family out of the city before God smokes them. All right. But before they, verse four, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, uh, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. I don't have to explain that, right? But that's perverts, perversion. And, and listen, the perversion of Sodom knows no limits. They wanted to have physical relations with two angels. That lifestyle is a violent lifestyle. And then look at verse number seven, verse six. And Lot went out at the door unto them and, and shut up the door after him and said, I pray you, what do you call them? Brethren? Righteous Lot. Bible says Lot was Righteous. Righteous Lot is calling Sodomites brethren. What, what, what was that about? That'll never happen to me and I'll never go that far and I'll never get that backslidden. That'll never happen to me. You don't have to worry about me, preacher. I'll never do that. So look what he does. It'd be bad enough if he called the Sodomites brethren and stopped there. Look at verse number 8. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. That would be bad enough if he just stopped there. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. He went from just living near Sodom to offering his virgin daughters to perverts. Righteous Lot. Side point here. Your backsliding doesn't affect just you. What about Lot's daughters? Hey, guess what, child of God? You go down, you're taking others with you. You're taking others with you. And there's a Bible principle to that. Write it down, the reference, if you're taking notes. But I'm going to read the verse to you. Romans chapter 14, verse number 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. It ain't just you. If I had a dollar for every Christian that I've talked to before being a pastor and since being a pastor who have said, leave me alone, it's just me we're talking about here. It's never just you. Can you imagine what Lot's two daughters thought about that? They just heard their own dad offer them to a violent group of perverted thugs? How did, it, how, how did he go from, how, how did he get to offering his daughter to perverts? He just looked up and saw something he wanted. No harm in that. 
Backslidden young people will bring their friends down. Backslidden adults will bring their friends down. And guess what? Backslidden husbands will bring their families down. I've heard stories all over the United States of America and other countries where a good woman got messed up because she was married to a backslidden devil. So what, 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 you say, well, man, can't get any worse than that. Oh, we're talking about Lot here, people. We're talking about you and me here, people. Yeah, well, it gets worse. How, uh, Brother Craig, how, much, how, how worse could it get than offering your pure daughters to perverts? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 19. Step number seven in the gradual process of backsliding, full-blown, no limit to sin. Look in Genesis chapter 19, look at verse number 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in the cave, he and his two daughters. <laughs> he could have been living on a mountaintop. And now here he is in a cave. Verse 31, And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Where in the world did they get that idea? Where did they get that idea? Living in Sodom. Living in Sodom. Oh, it, did, it didn't affect Lot's kids. Lot made the decision to live in Sodom, and it didn't, it didn't affect his kids. His two daughters are now concocting this scheme. Yeah, his, his wife's a pillar in the church. Verse 32, come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us uh, make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab, and the same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the children, or excuse me, and the younger, she also bare a son and called the name uh, Ben-Ami, the son of the same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Well, I never planned on it going that far. Neither did Lot. Neither did Lot. Can I boil Lot's backsliding down into a sentence? One sentence. Lot went from just living near Sodom to allowing himself to get drunk and committing incest with not one, but both of his daughters. Did you catch that? Just living near Sodom. To getting drunk. And having incest with his daughters. Wow. Wow. It ain't right, Brother Craig. But he didn't plan on doing that. 
Yeah, nobody plans on getting out of church either. Nobody plans on quitting reading their Bible either. Nobody, nobody plans on quitting praying either. Living close to the city of evil didn't seem like a bad idea until it was. Until it became that. Ask Lot if he ever dreamed he would end up fathering two children by his daughters. He would look at you and say, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. No way would I do that. That's exactly what happened. Well, why did that happen? How did that happen? Made bad choices. Made bad choices. That brings us to our next point, number three, signs of backsliding. Now, when I say signs of backsliding, understand this, okay? Get this in your mind. You have to, you have to get this. These next few things I'm going to give you, this is not why people get backslid. This is how you can tell people are backslid including yourself in your own life. Always start with you first, okay? Now, a couple of these are going to be repetitive, but it's, it, it fits, okay? This is how you can tell somebody's backslid. Number one starts with the same one from the other one, covetousness, covetousness. I'm not going to dwell on all these in detail because we did on some of them. Lot simply wanted something that he considered the supposed benefits only because he saw it with his eyes. He never asked God. The Bible never said that Lot prayed about where he should go. Number two, the draw of the world. You know how you can tell somebody is backslidden? They, they get attached to the world. Proof of that is Lot's wife. They're on their way out here in chapter 19, verse number 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. She ought to have been so happy to get out of that. She ought to have been so happy that her husband finally made a right choice. But guess what? You want to know why she looked back? She didn't want to leave. There was still a pull to her, a draw there. A person, a preacher, a brother, a sister is not being judgmental when they look at somebody who claims to be saved and can obviously tell they're worldly. That's not being judged. Well, you're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to judge. You don't know the context of judging. And by the way, that's not a judgment. That's an observation. I've, I, I, I've seen people pull. I, I have seen young people pull into this parking lot and forget that they're pulling into the church. You say, how did they forget they're pulling into the church? Because the music's on. And then all of a sudden it dawns on them. Oh. That's not a judgmental spirit. That's an observation. Another way you could tell people are backslidden, people get fearful of man. They don't fear God, they fear man. Matthew 26, 70 to 74, Peter denied the Savior because he was afraid of man. He was afraid of man. 
You want, another, uh, you want to know another way you can tell people are backslid? Number four, pride. Pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I'm telling you, people get lifted up in pride. They don't need God. They don't need anything or anybody else. Why? Because they got it all figured out. There's a young man who used to be, well, I guess he's still technically part of it. We got a young man sitting in the county jail because he had a contingency plan for every possible thing. He always had a plan, a way to get himself out of trouble. And now he's sitting in jail. How'd that contingency plan work? Pride. Well, you shouldn't talk about him like that. Just observation. If I was to go around this room and ask people who talked with him and have heard him say, well, if this happens, I'll just do this, we probably would have a few hands go up. Pride. Pride. You know, I know that another way you can tell people are backslidden? Selfish. Selfish. Our text verse, Proverbs 14, 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. One who is close to God will care about God's ways. A backslider don't give a rip what God thinks or anybody else thinks. A, a, a backslider does not care what God thinks, what God wants, what God says. A backslider will sit through a message like this and hear a man of God warn them about you might be on the wrong path and they'll say, eh, that's just his opinion. I mean, yeah, I'm, it, that probably, there are probably people that need to hear that message, but I, you know, I got it. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Lot. You know, you know the way you can tell people who are backslidden? Idolatry. Idolatry. Israel was constantly going after other gods. Aaron made a false god for them to worship. And then when he was all done and made this calf, Aaron, Aaron... Moses' brother, second in command of God's people, said, the, these, are the, these are the gods that brought you up out of Egypt. What? What? Idolatry. Brother Craig, I, I, I ain't got no golden calf in my closet. I don't have no, I don't have no statue sitting on my dresser. You're not going to go in my living room, Brother Craig, and find all these idols around there? This is the biggest idol we got. You want me to show you the biggest idol you got? That's the biggest idol you serve. Another, an another way you can tell people are backslidden, number seven, disobedience. Disobedience. 1 Samuel 15, 11, God said, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out unto the Lord all night. Disobedience. Here's what disobedience is. God says, Thou shalt, and you do. God says, Thou shalt not, or wait. God says, thou shalt and you don't. I knew I had it. Thou shalt and you don't. God says, thou shalt not and you do. Wow. You want to know another way? Uh, number eight, outward sign of backsliding, love of materialism. Remember the story in Joshua chapter 7 about Achan and the Babylonian's garment? God, uh, Achan wanted the expensive material stuff that God said he wasn't supposed to have. 
Number nine, another way you can tell people are backslidden, the love of money. Give me an example of the Bible on that. Judas. He betrayed the Son of God because that 30 pieces of silver looked good. I would say Judas was backslid. He was lost too. You know, you know uh, another one? Uh, here, here, here's another one. Here, here's another one. Loose morals. You say loose morals. Again, Solomon. You know what God said about Solomon? In, in, in Nehemiah chapter 13, God said that Solomon went after many outlandish women. That's what God said about him. Samson. Samson in Judges chapter 16, the Bible says he loved a harlot and he told his parents, go get her for me. Wine. Women and song. Loose morals. I'm going to tell you, we're living in the most immoral church age. I don't want to say, I mean, it got bad, you know, a lot obviously was in Sodom and all that, but in our lifetime, okay, never have I seen more Christians with loose morality. We have men and women and women in churches addicted to pornography. We have, I'm not saying men, men are, they're not any better, but that used to be something that it was the men involved with. If I told you stories, it would make you cringe of stories that I have heard from preachers all over this country about women in the churches messed up and all that stuff. Loose morals. You're not, you're, listen, you're not backslidden because you have loose morals. You have loose morals because you're backslidden. You already are backslidden. Number 11, love of the world. A, a sign that somebody is backslidden is just a love of the world. We all think love not the world or the things that are in the world in 1 John. But do you remember what Paul said about, about people that used to travel with him on his missionary journey? 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He departed. What happened? He got backslid. Okay, what do we do? All right. Please don't miss this afternoon. I'll just tell you where, where we're going to start this afternoon. We're going to look at the true cause of backsliding. The true cause of backsliding. I want to preach it now. Because I don't want anybody to miss it this afternoon. Can, can I just share with you something before we, before we dismiss here? I know that we have had three or four weeks of hard messages. And I make zero apology for that because I know as sure as I'm standing here, that is what God has laid on my heart to give to this church. But let me tell you why. 
I'm not, I'm, he's going to name names. No, no, no. I don't want New Life Baptist Church to go the way the rest of them are going. Not, a, not the rest of them, a lot of them are going. One of the names, okay, a, a pastor is a shepherd. A shepherd cares for the sheep. I, I went through a long list there about, uh, about how a person eventually, I used uh, church attendance as, a, as an example of how it's, you know, faithful and then all of a sudden they're not there. I, I, let me use that to prove this point. And, and you, you, don't, you can't see my heart. You, you just have to give me the benefit of the doubt, I guess. I know some pastors that when they see people missing church, they get mad. I don't get mad. It breaks my heart. You say, why does it break your heart? Because I see, I know the potential. And I know the devil's plan. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not hard. I, I know preachers that pride themselves in how hard they preach and, and they get with their preacher buddies on Monday morning. Oh man, I gave it to them yesterday. That's stupid. Any pastor that has that as his mentality needs to resign and go chop wood or something for a living. That's not a man of God who cares for his people. I haven't gone around bragging to my preacher friends about how hard it's been, the messages have been here. I, 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 that's not, listen, I don't want to see the devil destroy anybody in this church. And I know it could happen to any single one of us, including me. Before David Ireland ever came to the camp meeting in western New York, he went to a camp meeting in West Virginia. That camp meeting was one of the biggest camp meetings in the country. I never, I never went to it. I was never, it was before, uh, it was before I was able to travel and stuff like that. But, but I'm told, I mean, talking 800, 1,000 people in the tabernacle. And a, a, a good amount of the preachers would go to that meeting and then come up to our meeting in Buffalo. Kind of carry that same spirit. The pastor of that church is a drug addict today. I'm not ignorant that it can't happen to all of us, including me. These, these hard messages aren't too hard. They're not, I'm convinced they're not hard enough. Amen. I don't, I don't, I don't walk around. Even like I, as much as I used to, but, but like some other preachers do. But if I could, but, but if, I, if I wanted to, if I, well, I do want to, but I wish I could get in every single one of your faces this far from your face and saying the devil wants to take you out. You want, you want to know why I would say that to you? Because the devil wants to take you out. Every one of us. Can you imagine... Can you imagine Sister Seal, Sister Cecile? It would, it would probably, it would, it would be a knife in everybody's heart if Sister Cecile said, I hate this church. She cringed just when I said that. 
I'm not sent, I don't want to set her up for a fall. I'm simply saying that would be like an extreme, right? That would be like the shock of shocks. But the devil. But the devil. I'll never. Yep. Lot was the first redneck. He had, he had two sons and two grandsons. And they were the same people. I can't help it. I was thinking about that. I, I was thinking about that in my office. All right. You think Ray Stephen wrote the song, I'm My Own Grandpa. It was, it, a lot originated with that. I'm telling you, I can't, I can't make a big enough sign. I can't scream it loud enough. I can't, I, can't find, I can't find a microphone and a sound system that can be loud enough for me to say, Yesterday it was a lot. Today it could be any one of us. Any one of us. Oh, I, I mean, I might, you know, I might do some things, Brother Craig. You know, I might miss a service here and there. And, you know, I might, I might listen to something once in a while I shouldn't listen to. But I'm not going as far as Lot went. Mm-hmm. Right. Lot wasn't going as far as Lot went. But he did. Why? Why? Why would we Treat God the way that we treat God. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would... I pray, God, as I've been praying all week this week, Lord, you you are not going to make anybody do right. You're not going to make anybody stay close to you. You're not going to make people not get backslid. That is on us making right choices. But we sure do know that's what you want us to do. Help us to not get covetous or selfish. Help us to not be lifted up in pride. I pray, Father, that you bless our food and our fellowship and be with our service this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're just...